Here we go. Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis, the web's talk show about Gnosticism, mysticism, mystical traditions, both East and West, and anything else we feel like talking about uh, uh, this session today on the show. I'm Deacon Jonathan Stord, and I'm joined by my co-host, Bishop Laney Peterson. Hello, Bishop Laney. Hello, Deacon. I am so excited about today's show. I really am. So I'm really yes. looking forward to this, this conversation. Yeah, I uh, I am too, and I'm uh, I'm extremely excited. And the thing is, is, is we say this at the beginning of almost every show, but we're not liars. We I have just been so fortunate that some of the most amazing scholars and teachers and mystics that are alive and working out there right now uh, have come on the show. Uh, and that that leads us into our guest, which reminds me, we never do bios for our guests. <laughs> but, uh, I really should start doing some sort of proper intro, but we'll, you know, we'll have links in the show notes. But our guest is, uh, oh, whoops, I have the wrong thing on the screen there. Our guest is Dr. Ravi Ravindra. Uh, hello, Dr. Ravindra. Hello. <laughs> Happy to be here. So uh, uh, Dr. Ravindra is, uh, is, is a scholar, he's a writer, he's a mystic, he's uh, studied in uh, and taught in, in a few different traditions, both East and West. So it's going to be uh, uh, incredibly fascinating to, to talk to him. We're going to be talking about some of his specific books, about some of the more general mystical connections that he may see between East and West. Uh, before we get into this, uh, a quick plug, I'm going to try to go fast for our Patreon. We're brought to you by viewers and listeners like you. We literally can't do the show without your financial support. For as little as a dollar per piece of media per month, you can help keep us going. Uh, you can also put a cap on that if you're worried about how much media we're going to make that <laughs> month. And you can also do one-time donations over to paypal.com slash Gnostic. So you can go there, you can do a one-time donation. And if you're unable to help us out financially, we completely understand. Uh, you can also help us out by by liking and subscribing on both YouTube and the podcatcher of your choice, leaving us good reviews, telling people about the show, mm -hmm. sharing it on social media, melt the ear. It, it really does work. It really helps. Uh, you know, to take your favorite uh, episode and uh, email it to a friend. You're going to get a lot out of this episode. So share it with somebody special because they'll love it as well. Okay, the commercial is over. Uh, so, Dr. Ravindra, there's so many things we could talk to you about, and uh, but unfortunately, you know, we try to keep it about 45 minutes to an hour. So we'll start off with the book I'm currently reading, which is your book, The Gospel of John in the Light of Indian Mysticism. Uh, can you tell us a bit about what we can learn about Jesus and the Gospel of John through viewing it through the lens of, of Indian traditions and Indian mysticism? Because I think a lot of people might even just find this concept um, kind of strange. You know, what, what can I learn uh, from a different religious tradition uh, uh, when approaching Jesus in the Gospel of John? Well, first of all, as a kind of a general overall remark, in the biblical traditions in general, by which I mean Jude what usually gets called Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all Abrahamic traditions, there is not that much emphasis on mysticism as there is in the Indian traditions. In fact, I even remember when I was writing that book, I wanted to naturally interview and talk to many people. And one of the Protestant ministers actually said to me, oh, Christianity has nothing to do with mysticism. It is actually a Catholic heresy. Okay. Now, if you would believe this. Mm -hmm. It is also true, again, I mentioned this to you from my own experience. This is a slightly historical remark. Until approximately 1970, even if one went to a biblical bookshop, I was in Toronto University at that time, actually doing my PhD in physics in the mid 60s. Even in the biblical shops, you could not find any book on a Christian mystic. But there was a major shift starting in the beginning of 1970s actually, especially in California initially. And then you could find many books on Christian mystics, largely because I suspect, this is not my remark, this was actually a great scholar at Harvard University who wrote this book called Turning East, because many people, some of them looking for LSD, looking for this or that, went to India. And there were some of them, not everybody, 
was quite struck by the whole mystical tradition of India. And then they were searching for those traditions, those notions and ideas in the Christian tradition. So starting about the beginning of 1970s, you will find many books on Christian mystics. But it was almost impossible to find even a single book on them until the end of 1960, at least in the big city of Toronto. Hmm. It may be a little different in New York or somewhere else. So I think that is probably the reason why to come to it from the perspective of the mystical tradition of India has a slightly different angle. That doesn't mean that mysticism doesn't exist in Christianity. That would be a silly thing to say. <laughs> but the general religious background, by the way, I should make a remark here, which I hope doesn't offend you or your, your audiences. In my personal opinion, religions have done more harm to spiritual search than any other institution. Mm. Mm -hmm. more organized the religion, more harm it does. It just wants people to believe something or the other and not to search for something. For example, if you have gone to Catholic religious services, which is the most organized part of Christianity, where do they encourage you to search for anything? Just believe this or that, right from childhood onwards. That's what goes on. Mysticism required a searcher. Not, this is not really very much emphasized in the actual practice by any of the churches. So this is really part of the difficulty. And now you don't have to necessarily accept what I'm saying that religions have done more harm. It's the same thing, not only in Christianity, same thing in Hinduism, Buddhism, everywhere. Wherever it gets organized, they want you to follow some particular enunciations or a particular character, particular way of believing something or the other, but not the actual practice of how does it apply to me? Does it, this is really very much the scientific attitude. Even if the greatest scientists like Newton and Einstein said something, that doesn't make it true unless it corresponds to some experimental data. But in religious matters, just because it is quoted by somebody, Christ said this, so you must believe this. But if you look at it in much more detail, Christ was, in fact, I'm, well, I'm sure you are aware of the gospel of Philip, for example, the Gnostic gospel. Mm -hmm. Christ came not to make us Christians, but to make us Christ. This is the remark from the gospel of Philip. Yes. Now, how do I become Christ? That is a call, not just to become a Christian and just say, oh, Christ said this, so I believe it. He is the son of God and he'll save me. All very nice. We have two, nearly three billion Christians in the world. If they actually practiced anything, the world would be at a very different level of consciousness. Mm -hmm. yes. Same thing is everything I'm saying about Christianity now, because that's the background of our conversation. Exactly the same applies to Hinduism, Buddhism, everywhere else. So don't take my my remarks to be especially saying something against Christianity. No, I'm speaking about against organized religions. Right. So all you're saying all organized religion uh, can really become dogmatic, rigid, and sort of cut us off from the the doing and get us into the believing. Yeah, and also they naturally are organized around a particular event or a particular scripture or a particular figure, everything else has to be demeaned, has to be reduced in importance. Otherwise, you can't proclaim this is the only way. For example, in Catholic Church, you have extra ecclesiam nulla salus. Outside the church, there is no salvation. Well, fine. <laughs> I mean, so the Buddha can go to hell or Krishna can die, it doesn't make any difference. But only those who say, I believe in Christ, can go to heaven. How do you proceed with any search with that kind of attitude? Yeah, I completely agree. Now, in, in, the, in your book, um, you write about uh, Jesus emptying himself, right? And, and sort of um, going back to some of the language that, that Paul has in his letters about Jesus emptying himself on the cross. What, what does this 
emptying mean to you? Like, wh what does this statement mean that the Jesus emptied himself? And what is the connection to, to perhaps mysticism and the mystical search? Well, the call really in all spiritual searches is how can I become more and more free of me, me, me? <laughs> very standard remarks of Christ several times actually in every canonical gospel you can find some version of it unless you leave yourself behind you cannot be a follower of mine in fact occasionally it is said much more strongly unless you die to yourself you cannot be a follower of mine so it is really emptying oneself is really to free myself more and more from my desires and fears can I become an instrument of the will of God? Right. Christ himself actually explicitly even makes this kind of remark. Now let me actually quote to you from the Gospel of John. I'm not the author of the words I say. I say what my Father in heaven tells me to say. Now, even his words are not his. <laughs> He's completely free of himself, if you like. Mm -hmm. So that's really what I partly understand by emptying oneself. Emptying oneself of one's self-occupation, self-importance, me, 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 or mine, or my, all those various things. And we can just look at the world. I sometimes remind myself slightly with sadness. Right now, if you look at five or six major leaders ruling the world, Among those, you could say, for example, China, India, USA, Britain, Russia. Among them, they control probably 95% of the nuclear bombs, probably 85% of the economy. Is any of those leaders actually searching for any truth? What is running the world? How can I get ahead? How can I conquer others? or at least not be defeated by them. The whole rigmarole, you know, this is a remark of Christ, actually. The whole world is in the sway of the prince of darkness. Mm -hmm. This is not my remark, this is the remark of Christ. Yeah. So it's the prince of darkness that is ruling the world. And to free oneself of this is not so easy because survival in the world requires, as you just even yourself said mm -hmm. earlier, you need some money to survive in the world today. <laughs> yeah, precisely. And, and I think too, you know, a, a lot of modern Gnostics, we really take that that language uh, from the Gospel of John about it being, you know, the world being ruled by by darkness quite seriously. Maybe not always literally, but uh, quite, quite seriously. Um, so talk about the Gospel of John, why, why the Gospel of John? Why did you choose that text to, to write your book about? Well, when I came to Canada, this was, by the way, a long time ago. This was actually in 1961. I came to do a PhD in physics. That's my background, by the way. And having done a Master of Technology, but beginning to feel more and more that in technology, especially I was doing, my MTech was in oil exploration. I even remember that occasionally we could even find oil, but there never seemed to be any particular principles involved. So actually one of my professors said, well, physics at least has some principles. Maybe you should study physics. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I shifted to physics uh, from technology. And in any case, there coming to Canada, for me, people just would assume that I was a Hindu since I was coming from India. And I gradually, be, so they would ask me to tell them something about Hinduism. At that time, there were very few people from India, at least in Toronto. Mm -hmm. Since then, now there are many, many more people have come. In fact, Biden recently said, the Indian Americans are taking over USA. This is President Biden saying this. <laughs> but at that time, so people would ask me to tell them something about Hinduism. This is when I felt I should learn something about what the hell is Hinduism. And you're growing up, you think anybody Christian growing up as a Christian, are they knowing something about knowledgeable about Christianity? Yeah. They may or may not. So I certainly wasn't very familiar. 
But then I also felt strongly that here I am in a different culture with a different background, religious background in it, that I should learn something about Christianity. And then, of course, as you can well imagine, my fellow graduate students, this is physics department, they all thought it was strange that I should be going to church. This is weird. From their point of view, all ordinary scientists are convinced that religion is just stupid. Mm -hmm. This is amazing to me, actually, but, but this is the way it is. You can talk to any of the graduate students in any scientific department. They just dismiss the whole thing. Mm -hmm. But so in any case, for me personally, I wanted to learn. So in that process, I studied the Bible carefully, went to the church very frequently, to be sure. In fact, there was an organization called VCF, Varsity Christian Fellowship. Mm -hmm. They were very eager to take me in, as it were. And I soon discovered they were very keen to convert me to Christianity so that my soul could be saved. Mm -hmm. hmm? That seemed to be their program. <laughs> so in the process, I discovered while I reading the various gospels that the gospel of John struck me more than the other gospel. Later on, I discovered that many people within the Christian tradition have regarded that as the most spiritual gospel because it doesn't especially talk about any of the, for example, the birth of Christ or any of the historical details. Right from the very opening verses, it begins with a very large cosmological idea. In the beginning was the word, etc. as you know. So I hardly need to tell you all this. So I was very struck by John's gospel. And gradually, again, just to give you a brief introduction to this, there was another Christian organization there called SCM, Student Christian Movement, mm -hmm. or Spiritual Christian Movement. And they were trying to organize a few talks on different aspects of religion, not necessarily Christianity, but different aspects of religion. And some people who later on actually became quite famous, Marshall McLuhan, for example, spoke in that series, Northrop Fry, and Amil Hakana, uh, Amil, I've forgotten his name, a great Jewish rabbi. But nobody would agree to speak on mysticism in that large, very dig, great dignitaries, about six or seven of them. And so here I was a graduate student in physics speaking about mysticism. This is why I felt closer and closer to John's gospel because it has much more of that resonance, at least from my perspective. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that the other gospels don't have some of the, in fact, at that time, the Gnostic gospels were not even published very much. I was not aware of them. It's only later on I was aware of the Gnostic Gospel. So for me, John's Gospel was actually the closest to the mystical aspects of Christianity. Since then, one would see Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Philip, other Gospels are closer to it. So that's the reason I got interested in John's Gospel. Yeah. And throughout history, like just as you said, you've heard, you know, it's the most spiritual gospel. And I know that many esoteric Christians and Gnostic Christians and mystical Christians also throughout the last 2000 years have been drawn to to yeah. to the gospel of John. But yeah. a, a question uh, uh, about the gospel of John. In John, Jesus spends a, a lot of time talking about himself. And it's, it's the only gospel where he says a lot of I am statements. So with this sort of focus on him and his identity and talking about himself, in some way, doesn't that make it like a little less mystical or a little less like, you know, if I'm a mystic looking to uh, to become more godlike, you know, reading this book, well, isn't this just all about Jesus speaking about himself? No, I think it's important for us to be a little clear here. First of all, let me make a slightly general remark. Then if you wish, I will try to defend that. Wherever Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, any of his great statements, mm -hmm. they should actually be read, I am is the way, the truth, and the life. I am is the English version of the Greek ego emi, which is the version of the Hebrew Yahweh. Take my word for it. You can read now in detail. Jesus' name is 
not this is the english version joshua which comes from hebrew yehoshua which literally means yahweh saves that's the name of jesus wherever he says i am the way the truth and the life or any such other remarks please read them carefully as i am is the way which is to say yahweh is the way nothing else this is why now don't take my word for it mm-hmm. you can go to exodus especially chapter 3 verse 14 as you well know god speaks to moses to go and tell the pharaoh to let his people go moses is running away from the law he has killed an egyptian soldier if he goes back he'll be arrested probably killed so he's running away meets a farmer understandably falls in love with his daughter marries her and starts doing farming this is where this is in egypt and now we have a very great monastery there actually the oldest christian monastery still intact saint catherine's monastery in egypt which i have actually visited this is where he sits meets the burning bush and from there he goes up the mount sinai which is actually i recommend it to you folks to do it it's a lovely passage mm. and there he is told by god to go and tell the pharaoh to let my people go now moses as i said he is hardly willing to go to talk to the pharaoh he'll be arrested so he says who should i say has sent me this is the first time the word yahweh is actually used in the bible and then you you probably know that that even the torah was read in mostly read in greek even in the synagogues for several centuries because of the roman conquest mm-hmm. and yahweh was always translated as ego ami i am and so the remark you see this read exodus chapter 4 verse 14 and i so he god says to moses go tell the pharaoh that i am has sent you now to be sure i should also tell you sometimes partly because it doesn't make english sentence sensible occasionally some translators add i am who i am that is not there in the original hmm. i am is the name of god so when christ says i am the way the truth and the life read it carefully actually in general in my book as you would notice i don't give many references but this particular point was specially important to emphasize so this is the one time only i give actually a reference to a well known christian theologian who has two volumes on john's gospel he actually agrees with me that that's what christ is saying you can read the particular reference to that i don't usually give many references i'm not trying to do a scholarly thing i'm coming to the book or to the writing in john's gospel really much more with a heart rather than with the intellectual argumentation one way or the other i'm not particularly interested in the arguments because it's just odium theologicum never gets anywhere yeah but if one is willing to feel something subtle feeling is the first avenue to truth according to all spiritual teachers unless the heart calls you nothing is going to happen so read that carefully you would see that christ is not promoting himself that will be the last thing even he actually says i am not the author of the words i use <laughs> i do nothing on my own he is completely submitting him submitting himself totally emptying himself of whatever is me 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 there this is actually the call by the way in the bhagavad gita by krishna actually the emphasis there let me if you don't mind my using one sanskrit word is nash karmaya which literally means action less less do nothing hmm. but krishna then goes on to say that nash karma is not in action it is in a way freedom from my action can i become 
an instrument of the will of Krishna in that case, but for Christ, it would be the instrument for the will of God or his own father. Otherwise, it is my will, my desire, my achievement. So to be free of that is the fundamental requirement. In fact, as I earlier quoted to you from John, from this is actually, you can find in all the Gospels, but this is particularly in the Gospel of Matthew. Unless you leave yourself behind, you cannot be a follower of mine. This is the remark mm -hmm. of Christ. Hmm? Similarly, in every other teaching, for example, a very old text in India called Shatapath Brahmana, it actually says, when a searcher comes to the sun door, which is a way of coming to enlightenment, he will be asked, who is it? If the answer is anything other than nobody, he may not enter. So I think the call really in any spiritual practice is how to be following a way, but at the same time being out of the way. Mm -hmm. It's not my achievement, not my getting somewhere to heaven or enlightenment or whatever. Can I become an instrument of the will of Krishna or God, whatever label speaks to you? That is really very much, in fact, that is the very reason for our existence. I often remind people of the obvious fact that I did not create myself. Mm -hmm. And I actually say, seriously, if this one single sentence, I can remind myself periodically, who could disagree with this? But if I can remind myself of this periodically, it will change my life completely. Because if I did not create myself, why have, after all, there are trillions of galaxies, very delicate laws, and every religious tradition says that the whole universe is created by the highest level of consciousness. God, Brahma, Allah, whatever label speaks to you. Are these labels of consciousness dumb to create me for a few decades in this vast universe? What is the purpose? If one can remember just this one single sentence, and nobody could really disagree with this, I did not create myself. And it's actually the breath of God which is keeping me alive. You can read this in the book of Genesis. Again, I'm always surprised. So much emphasis on sin, 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 especially in the Catholic tradition. This is, I happily invite you, second chapter in the book of Genesis, seventh verse. Literally, this is what it says. God created human beings. I'm saying human beings. It actually says man there. <laughs> God created human beings from the earth. Then he breathed his own breath into them to make them alive. As long as I'm alive, it's the breath of God which is keeping me alive. I'm not keeping myself alive. I didn't decide to create this body. I wouldn't have the foggiest idea. I don't even know how to create my nails to imagine creating my breathing apparatus <laughs> or to create the air that I need to stay alive. No, I think when I'm really speaking very simply, I'm completely amazed by all this lot of rigmarole about theology, this or that. Simple, simple awareness. I am here, not created by my will, my desire, by very subtle forces under extremely delicate laws and only for a few decades. This used to be the standard thing in all Christian monasteries. Whenever a monk met another monk, he would say, brother, remember death. Mm -hmm. Memento mori was the classical expression in Latin. Simply because if I can remember that whatever I usually call myself, my body, my mind, my possessions, whatever my shtick is, as the American, <laughs> I like this American expression. Yes. We don't use this in Canada very much. So whatever my shtick is, that will all disappear. And now in my, at my age, I'm almost 83 years old. I could hardly say many decades. Even one more decade would be surprising. 
Therefore, it is important to try to at least have some interest in trying to understand what forces or energies have created me and why. Mm -hmm. That seems to me, in fact, you can actually read this, this suggestion in all spiritual traditions, including in Christianity, but not in the standard formation of Christianity, sadly. But St. Augustine, I can quote to you here, that every level of reality is trying to evolve. Therefore, it needs to undertake certain action. So a particle of spirit that has taken on my body, because that particle is trying to evolve, to come back home, come back to God. And in order to evolve, it needs to undertake some action. Therefore, it needs an appropriate body and mind. So my, whatever I usually call myself, is meant to be the instrument to assist the evolution of the particle of the spirit or the breath of God that has made me alive. That's the purpose. So one needs to therefore try to understand in quiet work, try to see more and more clearly what in me actually the real... Let me remind you of a remark of St. Paul here. We have a spiritual nature and we have a carnal nature. This is a direct quote from St. Paul. Mm -hmm. And in general, they are in opposition to each other. And the call is, can my carnal nature, which is meant to be an instrument for the evolution of the spiritual aspect of me, that's the call. So unless I begin to slightly become aware of what my spiritual nature wishes or needs, and then I can my instrument, which is what I usually call me, or in Latin script, we have the great advantage of it, uppercase and a lowercase. So self with a, a uppercase self is the real me, real I, and the self with the lower self is my usual self. How can my lower self or the usual self or me or the ego assist the evolution of the self with the capital S? That's the raison d'etre of everybody's existence, not only mine, because each one of us has a unique particle of divinity and a unique possibility of bringing our own unique song of praise for God. So nobody needs to necessarily follow everybody else. <laughs> I need to search what is the call in me, call, divine call, if you like. And this is actually, as I said, if you read St. Augustine carefully, this is what he said, our soul, I'm quoting him now, yeah. our soul cannot be at rest until it is stayed in God. That's the call. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so specifically in, in sort of the uh, the Christian context, I, I guess I guess kind of a two part question. Now you already mentioned that it's perhaps some of the problem is religion itself, right? Organized religion, be it be it Christianity, be it Buddhism, it can sort of have this effect of of pushing down, pushing away the mystic search, you know, of making everything uh, rule-based, based on belief. Uh, but that said, it does seem that the mystical path in Christianity seems to be more hidden than in some other traditions and in Eastern traditions. So I guess my, my two-part question, why does it seem like the mystical path is more hidden in Christianity? And two, if there's a spiritual seeker out there who's perhaps a Christian, still feels an attachment to Christianity, but should they should they convert to another tradition if they want to be very serious about uh, the mystical path? Certainly in contemporary times, first of all, it's important to realize <clears throat> that really it's mostly only after the Second World War 
that there has been a great proliferation of technology which allows communication across traditions and cultures, not only communication, but also travel. And it's not that earlier people didn't go anywhere, but extremely few people went anywhere. And I can say this from my own experience, as I told you earlier also, when I came in 1961, there were very few people of Indian origin in the large city of Toronto. And about 10 years back, a census was done in Toronto. More than half the residents in Toronto were born outside Canada. Now, this may not be true for every major city. I'm just telling you the situation, mm -hmm. biggest city of Canada. So partly because of possibility of travel, possibility of communication. One can be at least, at least at some level, often superficial level, but sometimes that depth become aware of other teachings, other traditions. These days, it will be almost impossible for anybody, even remotely educated, not at least have heard of the Dalai Lama. <laughs> That doesn't mean necessarily they know very much about Buddhism, but they would have heard of him, something he may have said they have heard or read. So I think, but to more strictly to come back to your question, if you look at the whole of the biblical tradition, any of the prophets, what you don't find, none of them are searchers. Look at the contrast with the Buddha before he became the Buddha, enlightened. He's struck by an old man, a sick man, and a dead man. And he wonders, is that the end? So he's searching something. This is very central to the whole of the Indian tradition, search. In the biblical tradition, always the initiative is from God. L read the whatever we are told about any of the prophets, Abraham, Moses, Muhammad, God takes the initiative. In fact, in my judgment, this is really the reason why God in the biblical tradition is called He, because generally speaking, activity is associated traditionally with males mm -hmm. and receptivity with females, partly based on the genitalia. That has become more or less the traditional style. And I know theologians keep arguing why God should be only he, why not she or it. My own impression is largely because the, all the initiative in the biblical tradition comes from God. Then he speaks to one prophet or the other, and the prophet seems to have no choice, as if they are struck from the scruff of the neck and they oblige, they, are, they submit. So it's not arising from search. Whereas if you look at any of the sages in the Indian context, they are, searching, they are struck by the fact that they are being driven by fear and desire, or they will die, etc. Mm -hmm. And then they search for how can one be free of that. So it's a very, and this is also, by the way, the reason why if you, I actually invite people, these, I'm, everything I say is just common sense, by the way. I mean, it's, I, this is actually, I often ask people, why you invite me to say anything? Because it's all obvious, everything I say. You look at any of the sculptures or paintings of the prophets in the Abrahamic tradition, they're always shown in a posture of prayer. Now, if you look at any of the sages in India, they will be shown in postures of meditation. Now, strictly speaking, both of them actually very deeply have to go inside oneself. But at the ordinary level, mass level, which is not very subtle, prayer looking up means God is up there. Angels are up there, outside, in heaven, somewhere up there. Whereas in meditation, as if God is inside me, that's where I need to search. Mm -hmm. So the whole culture is influenced by these ideas, art, music, or actually we had a very great writer in at the University of Toronto, Northrop Fry, who actually wrote a book called The Great Code, 
the whole book is about how the English language is very much influenced by the biblical tradition. Mm -hmm. So it then it becomes part of the culture. Therefore, unless God calls me, I'm not searching for anything. Mysticism requires <laughs> searching for something. Mm -hmm. then an occasional one can actually find something. There are very few people who actually come to any truth. There is no point fantasizing. As I sometimes joke about it, only in California, you can have a weekend workshop and you can be enlightened. <laughs> in, India, in India, it takes many lifetimes. Even the Buddha took many lifetimes before mm -hmm. he was enlightened. Hmm? So there is no point trying to be stupidly simple about all this. This is a very large project. Mm -hmm. either to listen to what God is calling. Ultimately, in my judgment, they are not so radically different, but culturally they become different. Their representations become different. As I just said, look at any postures of any of the prophets. In fact, it's rather ironic, I, if I were to, able to show you. In India, whenever they show the image of Christ, always in a meditation posture. Ah. Because mm -hmm. for them, that's the whole meaning of any great sage, <laughs> that they are inwardly looking, searching. But you show me any posture of Christ, any image in the biblical, in the whole of European or American tradition, in a posture of meditation. It's mm -hmm. almost impossible to find yeah. it. I'm making a grand generalization here. Yeah, there but, may be it's entirely possible there are exceptions. But in any case, the point to be made is this, the reason why certain things become outward looking rather than inward looking are because of some of these expressions, such as God calling the prophets and they are obliged to submit, which also already indicates that they understand something, they are resonating to something. So no need to be against the prophets. I'm not making that point here. I hope you understand that it's not trying to be critical of something, it's trying to see how the cultural representations differ from each other and how they end up influencing the mind or the set of the people who encounter them. Sure. So changing track a, a little bit, um, we, uh, you know, I mentioned at the, at the top of the show that, that you've actually uh, studied and, and written about uh, some, some different traditions. Um, but uh, we talked about Gurdjieff on the show before and, and the fourth way, the work. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about who was Madame de Salzman and, uh, and, and how did you meet her? <laughs> Madame de Salzman was really regarded as the head of the Gurdjieff teaching after the death of Gurdjieff, which was in 1949. And she lived until the age of 101, until 1990. So if you like for 41 years, she was head of the whole Gurdjieff teaching. And she is actually the one responsible for starting the various Guruji foundations in mm -hmm. Paris, in London, in New York, and in Venezuela. And also responsible for publishing some of his books and also bringing the movements to the public domain, showing them occasionally here, there. So in that sense, she is very much responsible for this dissemination of the Gurdjieff teaching and obviously very highly regarded by anybody in the Gurdjieff tradition for obvious reason, not simply because she was like any good Pope could also do much of this dissemination, but very few Popes in history have been canonized as saints even though canonization is determined by their own rules nobody else is deciding it. Some of the saints are absolutely terrible people in their behavior. But just because they killed many Hindus or burned many Hindu temples, so they've been canonized as saints. See, it's absolutely terrible what has gone on 
in the name of the organization. Mm -hmm. But in any case, in her case, it's not only a matter of just organizational ability, but her presence, extremely striking. Mm -hmm. And very much herself, would she would say, very much evolving herself. She didn't start at that level, but this is really the call which makes the search to be meaningful. Mm -hmm. I actually first met her <laughs> slightly accidentally, not knowing who she was. I had met in 1968, Mrs. Welch, who was one of the senior people yes. Yes. in the Guruji of teaching. In fact, I regard her as my spiritual mother. Gradually, she became more and more important in my life. She invited me on 13th January 1969. 13th January, by the way, is said to be Gurujeev's birthday. It's actually mm -hmm. the New Year's Eve in the Orthodox Church, but it just gets associated with his birthday. Strictly speaking, we don't really even know when is his birthday. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that doesn't matter. But that occasion mm -hmm. gets celebrated in the Gurujeev teaching as his birthday. So they were having a special movements class so Mrs. Welch invited me to go there. And much to my surprise, I saw that first movements class, not knowing anything about movements. I didn't even know the word movement. I had no knowledge of the Gurdjieff teaching. I had read a little bit about it in the Uspensky's book. But then another lady comes and sits on my other side. So I saw this movements class sitting between Mrs. Welch and this other older lady. And after the class, I was introduced to her, but nobody introduced her to me. So I had no idea who she was because if you're, if the queen is next to you, you're introduced to the queen. Nobody introduces the queen to you. It was mm -hmm. Madame de Salzman, <laughs> I discovered later on. And she questioned me very much about how one particular movement had struck me. Where did I feel the energy, et cetera, et cetera. I was very surprised by the numbers of questions she asked me about that movements class, which I had just watched. So this is when I first met her without knowing who it is that I'm meeting. <laughs> Later on, I had several occasions to meet her, but only from 1980 onwards until her death in 1990. Then I worked with her very closely. Almost every year I would go to Paris mm -hmm. for maybe four to five weeks, or I will meet her in London where she went or in New York, but mostly in Paris. So that's the background. In um, your book, um, Heart Without Measure, there is a, uh, a story from the, in the beginning of the book that has struck with me, stuck with me for a very long time. And it was when you had gone to Paris to meet with her, you had an appointment um, <laughs> in the Gurdjieff work, being on time is very important. And um, there was an unfortunate set of circumstances that kept you from getting there on time. Yes. And her remark to you, because you were, you know, obviously concerned about what was happening. And she said to you, we must not give in to reaction. Yes. And that for me was one of those things where the, they, it strikes you. It's, yes. it, it struck me uh, about, and that's something that I've tried to hold with me is not giving in to reaction, the reactive reactivity to circumstances many times that are not under our control and becoming someone different or, or not and not being um not being our being and it reminded me of a few things that mr gurjeep would say he would say first of all we can only strive to be christians and that, mm -hmm. that was very important but the yeah. other thing he often he gave a a teaching once when he talked about somebody gets up and they can't get their coffee and so, you know, they don't have their coffee and so they're in a bad mood and they're insulting and then they manage to get their coffee, then they're in a good mood and then something bad happens and then they're in a bad mood and going back and forth. And he said, how this, can this man call himself a Christian? <laughs> and I think that the, 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 these teachings um, have tied together for me uh, very much. And what you were talking about, about earlier is, um, you know, we, we people, don't uh, are not necessarily striving to be Christians. If they were, this planet would be operating very differently. Yes. And but for me, um, 
coming back to that one moment in, with, in which Madam said to you, we must not give in to reaction, that has been something that I've been able to hold with me. Actually, in my personal understanding, almost the whole spiritual development can be expressed in two words to move from reaction to response. Look at the classical image of Christ on the cross. Anybody else that I can imagine, including myself, would be wanting to get off, cursing and swearing, blaming somebody or the other. But what did he say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Yeah. Here is a response, not a reaction. And in my judgment, really practically, the whole spiritual development can be expressed in these two words. Although I think there is another level, which is also manifested I, early, as I said, to go beyond any action so that action is being done through me, but not by me, mm -hmm. which is exactly the case with Christ, which is the call by Krishna to anybody. In fact, Krishna even ends up defining a, an advanced yogi sees that I do nothing at all. This is a direct quote from the Bhagavad Gita. I am not doing anything, but it is all being done through me. That is the next stage. But before that, a response rather than reaction. Mm -hmm. In my judgment, really, in a way, one can speak a great deal about this kind of heaven, that kind of heaven, that sort of enlightenment. But at a practical level, it's very simple, easy. If I actually try to practice moving away a little bit more and more freedom from reaction, that will assist spiritual development. Mm -hmm. yeah. Staying with the the work, I, I'm just curious, and and I hope that I can I can articulate this well. But you know, we uh, I, I've mentioned a few times that, of course, you're a man between both religion and science, but you're also someone who's between and involved with, and who has studied and written about uh, a number of of spiritual traditions. Uh, that's, so I'm wondering with the Gurji. Uh, tradition with the work with the fourth way when you have all these these different choices and you're already connected or studying some different traditions what was it about uh the gurdjieff work that that grabbed your attention that 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 uh and kept it for for all for all these years what was there something quite specific about that school yes well first of all gurdjieff himself actually says and i'm first of all just quoting one of his aphorisms take the understanding of the east and the knowledge of the West, and then seek. So his teaching tries to bring both of these traditions together. That's one thing. Because each tradition, for example, in India, let me give you an example, what has very much bothered me about the Indian tradition, especially coming from Shankara, who is regarded as the greatest philosopher in India, very much enhancing what is called Advaita Vedanta non-dualistic Vedanta. He actually makes this remark. I won't bother to tell you this in Sanskrit. Simply saying, Brahma is true. The world is illusion. This, is, in my judgment, has done more harm to the whole culture of India. They ignore the world. You can, If you have ever been to India, you can go to anybody's house. They'll be nice, neat and clean inside. But you go to the neighborhood, nobody gives a damn what is taking place there. Because it's all illusion. And for me personally, the very important aspect of the Gurjeev teaching is, and here I more or less quote Madame de Salzman, there is a current of energy coming from above. If you like, it's the spiritual nature according to St. Paul. And there is a current of energy coming from below the carnal nature. Both currents need to be taken care of, but in the proper perspective. To me, that is a necessity for anything, any involvement in assisting the quality of the world, our planet, 
as well as relating with something subtle. In fact, you can actually find this kind of thing even in the remarks of Christ. Let me quote to you. At one place he says, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's, but my kingdom is not of this world. Gurjeev teaching tries actually to give unto Caesar what is Caesar's. The current coming from the animal side, from the worldly side. It is not that you can't find this in Hinduism. The Bhagavad Gita is almost wholly devoted to this. In fact, that is the reason I ended up writing, I wrote my own translation of the Bhagavad Gita and a whole commentary on it later on. That was published in 2017, whereas my book on the Yoga of the Christ was published in 1990. So it took me many years to struggle with it. But the point I'm trying to make, you can actually find, if you're looking for it, you will find this kind of suggestion in all serious teachings, Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, because none of these sages are against the world. They wish to take care of the world. Why is Christ actually even the Lord's prayer? My, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He's not saying to forget about the earth. <laughs> But the, but one can get too occupied with the earth and forget that his Christ kingdom is not in this ordinary world. So I think if we can remember both of these comments of his, they're in two different gospels, by the way. They're not in the same gospel. They're not in the context of each other, but I'm bringing it from two different directions. Similarly, for me, the Gurdjieff teaching is certainly not against the world. Mm -hmm. Any of the serious Gurdjieff people that I have met, I have met many of the senior people in the Gurdjieff teaching. Mm -hmm. All of them had their jobs, they had their families, they had houses occasionally leaked, they had to take care of it. They were not monastics. Mm -hmm. They are not thinking this world is an illusion and move away from it. Whereas that is a bit of a tendency in India, very strongly, sadly, from my point of view. So. Why am I? It's not, there is no shortage of wisdom or shortage of, <laughs> shortage of great, great human beings in Christianity or in Hinduism or in Buddhism, everywhere. But throughout human history, in my judgment, in every culture, every geographical place, some people really search for the truth. Extremely few actually are able to come to anything real. Then other people who are around them just cannot believe this. So they say, oh, he must be half God, half man, or he must be an incarnation of God, or he must be son of God. He can't possibly be a human being. So we then elevate them to a pedestal so that we don't actually have to practice what they are bringing. Just we worship them, keep quoting them. That's what we do. On the other hand, it is absolutely true. Every culture, every tradition has some very profound people who actually search for truth and came to something. To be sure, they don't always get written down. Some of them get killed, some get, you know, countries, especially European countries, colonized all various places, burnt many things. You can see this in uh, Many, many places, actually, for example, especially I was talking of Timbuktu, which I used to think was just a way of saying, go to hell, go to Timbuktu. Mm -hmm. It's actually a town which I have visited in Mali. And in the 13th century, according to a great historian and scholar, Hilary Armstrong, he was a great, he translated all books of Plotinus. He said to me that every professor at Oxford would have been jealous of what was taking place at Timbuktu. It was so highly learned. The whole algebra is a, it's an Arabic word in any case. It developed there. Hmm? But now it has been all occupied, all kinds of shenanigans, all these fundamentalist Muslims are destroying the libraries there, etc. Same thing happened at, earlier in Alexandria. Fundamentalist Christian destroyed the libraries there so that all you need to do is to believe in Christ. You don't need to read any of these books. So you see the kind of thing I mean, but everywhere some people have searched for truth and an occasional one has come to something very great. But then 
we either don't want to listen to them, certainly don't want to practice what they're teaching. <laughs> I hope you people are encouraging people to practice something, not simply to believe X, Y, Z. Okay. Yeah. That, I think that's definitely a big focus of the show and in our lives always, uh, both working on ourselves to make sure we're actually doing something and, of course, encouraging others to, uh, to you know, to have that spiritual practice. And um, to take care so, of our world. We, yes. you know, I occasionally say we are children of both heaven and earth. We need to honor both parents. Yeah. Very good. I, that's actually good. I might, I might write. I'll have to write that down. And <laughs> it's, it's really great that that you spoke at length about that, about being the, the child of heaven and earth. Because what you're talking about with India, right? This uh, 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 the wanting to get out of the world, uh, seeing the world as an illusion. You know, this is very strong in the the Gnostic tradition. And I think sometimes we spend some time on the show trying to square the circle. Right, uh, because uh, even though that is a big part of the tradition, you know, for me, this is this is where I am right now. I'm in this world. This is this is the the grounds of enlightenment. Right, this is where I've got to do it. So that means engaging with the world and, in some ways, being part of the world. So. Um, now we are getting into to wrap up uh, territory. Unfortunately, I, I could go. I could keep you for hours, <laughs> Doctor <laughs> Ravindra. Um, but, uh, uh, but before before we start to wrap up, this is the beginning of the of the starting of the wrapping up. Uh, Bishop Laney, do, do you have more questions or any follow up questions? Uh, not at this time. But I, I want to thank the doctor for coming to uh, talk with us today. This has been fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, uh, Ravindra. So before we, we do leave, um, I'll put you up here. So I, I we for the people who are watching instead of listening, uh, I have the uh, homepage for Dr. Ravindra up, which is just his last name, Ravindra.ca. Is that that's right, right, Dr. Ravindra? CA for Canada, not for California. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, through, through, through your website, you have all your books listed. People can get them there. You also have uh, audio and video of, of lectures and interviews. You have articles that you've written and, and articles that other people have written about you. Um, is, is there anything else you wanted to, to tell people about? I, I guess, you know, any courses, new books, uh, talks, lectures, anything out there that, that people might be interested in? No, my only general remark really is I invite people to be searchers, to bring a truly scientific spirit. In the scientific spirit, laws of nature are not, even though Newton was an Englishman, but the law he discovered, law of gravitation, doesn't apply only in England. And it is not understood only by the English. So search for the truth, which is transcultural, transreligious, translinguistic, but also to search how does it apply to me? How can I in fact experience what Christ is teaching or what the Buddha is teaching? Of course, it requires understanding the language they were using. Each, each great teacher is speaking in a particular context, has a background history. Some of them are in a desert, some of them are in forests, so that itself changes their language. But to try to go beyond that kind of limitation and to search for and to assist these great teachers own wish to assist the evolution of our own planet and anybody we encounter, including ourselves. That's my wish. Beautiful. Thanks so much. Okay, well, uh, the, before we go, I'll, I'll quickly do uh, my plug, which is just uh, holygrail.substack.com. Um, that's uh, my parish uh, in Montreal, but uh, we're doing stuff online until the end of the crisis, so that, which is hopefully soon. I have my first shot. So uh, hopefully uh, anybody out there who wants to check that out while it's online. Uh, something that's always online is mileendmeditation.substack.com. I do uh, open, free, secular mindfulness meditation every Sunday morning. It's a mix of guidish and quiet, and it's good for both those experienced and for those who may be new to sitting. We have a great group that comes out. It's it's free. It's open. Feel drop in anytime. A mile and meditation. 
www.thoughtsubstack.com. Uh, uh, Bishop Laney, do you have anything you would like to plug? Um, yes, I will be. As many of you know, I've had a candle ministry, candle and prayer ministry for some time. It's uh, been uh, just that kind of down and down low lately, uh, just as I've been we're doing some recuperation here on my end, but that will be gearing up very soon. You can find me on Facebook if you want to get more information about that, and the page will be back up soon. Also, uh, as many people know, one of my uh, more um, earthly uh, pursuits is is cooking and wine, and I do have a wine review blog and podcast, No Chalice Required, for anybody who happens to be interested um, in, in, in food pairing, wine, the culinary arts. Um, that would be something for you to check out. Wonderful. Okay. Well, this is Deacon Jonathan Stewart signing off. Dr. Ravindra, thanks again. Thank Bishop you. Laney, thanks so again. And uh, uh, I said thanks so again, but thanks so much again. <laughs> um, and, uh, and thanks so much to you, whoever is listening and watching this. Absolutely. Uh, I'm sure you got a lot out of it. Okay. Farewell. Thank Bye, you. everybody. Thank you for inviting me. Thank, Thank you. you for coming. Thank you.